fourth and final talk. And uh, finally, I should bring the cohomological Hall algebra in the title into the game. And uh, so that's the last opportunity. Okay, so where are we in our logic? So we started uh, with the slogan, we just want to count quiver representations. And as a device for counting, we uh, defined this motivic ring, or this localized rotatic ring of varieties. And so this led us to uh, writing down this zeta function like or partition function like motivic generating function in the motivic quantum space of the quiver. And then we have seen three different ways of factoring. Just write factorization one, factorization two, and factorization three. Three different ways of of factoring aq in a purely formal sense. So this was kind of a logarithmic q derivative and it led to motivic generating function of Hilbert schemes of uh, associated to this quiver. The factorization two, that was the wall crossing formula. And it led us to uh, look at these moduli spaces of semi-stable representations and their motives. And then finally, the third factorization brought us to dt invariance and to the uh, intersection cohomology of these moduli spaces. Okay, so just from this purely formal factoring, this motivic generating series, lots of interesting geometry popped up. And the slogan for today is we want to categorify everything. So, categorify AQ and the various factorizations. <clears throat> and um, what does it mean to categorify this thing? So, this means find an algebra. So, a really an interesting algebraic object, in this case a graded associative algebra, whose Poincaré series is precisely this motivic generating series. So, find an algebra appropriately graded, whose Poincaré series is AQ. So, and um, in the first three talks, I, I really wanted to go into all the details of these shift factors, yeah, all these ugly shifts by minus squared of the left shed's motive. This were really important for me because it is important in all this theory, but just for, for time reasons, I will not manage to do all the details today. So, uh, at some point, I just, so for example, uh, in the verification that this algebra, which I will now write down, has this property that its Poincaré series is this, I have to skip a few details and uh, work a bit suggestively, uh, because otherwise we're just doing a 20 minute calculation, which at the end is almost trivial. Okay, so, and this algebra is the so called cohomological Hall algebra, or a candidate for this, the only known candidate in general. This is the cohomological Hall algebra. Of Q. So that's the algebra I will, I will now introduce as precise as possible and uh, then try to give you a bit of a feeling of the, of the features of this. And uh, so what we do is the following. So first recall Well, the, the key to all the geometry of quiver representations, ah, let me write this down here. The key to all geometry of quiver representations was this idea that quiver representations of a fixed dimension are, correspond to the points of some affine space on which you have a base change group and uh, the stack of quiver representations, the stack of isoclasses of quiver representations is just the quotient stack of this affine space by this group. Yeah? So this will be central again. Um, so recall 
with group action and for simplicity, since I will write down many, many of these spaces RD, let me now omit the Q. Because I will work over a fixed quiver, yeah? So I, I should really write RD of Q, but let me omit it in the notation. All right, so here's the candidate for the cohomological Hall algebra, which we'll just write as curly H of Q. Take the direct sum over all dimension vectors. Well, like in the genera in motivic generating function, we took the sum over all dimension vectors of the motive of the quotient stack. And here we take the equivariant cohomology of the representation space, say with uh, rational coefficients. Yeah? So the direct sum of all equivariant cohomology of these spaces. This is the space, the underlying space. And um, we will see that this has more or less nothing to do with the quiver. Um, the fact where the quiver comes into the game is only in the multiplication, which we will now define. So define a multiplication. Define a multiplication on H of Q by and now let me first define the, the multiplication by a one-line slogan and then uh, give the exact definition. And the slogan is by convolution along the stack of, the stack of short exact sequences. This should be along the stack of short exact sequences. So, short exact sequences define kind of a Hecke correspondence. Namely, from a short exact sequence, you can either project to the middle term or to the two outer terms. The two outer terms are representations of dimension vector D and E, say, and the middle term is a, a representation of dimension vector D plus E. And this, and if you somehow convolve along this Hecke correspondence, then you get uh, the multiplication. But let's make this precise, because ultimately uh, I want to convince you that all we are doing here is uh, basic linear algebra with a lot of conceptual überbau, but at the end it's just linear algebra and also in the definition of this uh, convolution product it's the same. So let me write down the following diagram of spaces and groups. So we want to have an equivariant cohomology class here and produce an equivariant cohomology class here out of it. So inside here, we take the closed subset of, now this is kind of a symbolic notation, upper triangular block matrices. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, RD plus E consists of tuples of linear maps. Linear maps from a di plus ei dimensional space to a dj plus ej dimensional space. Okay, since we have this, this decomposition of the dimension anyway, we can split these matrices into two by two block matrices. And we just look at the closed subset of two by two block matrices with a lower left block being zero. Okay, that's the natural inclusion, iota. And we also have a natural projection map. Namely, this projection means forget this extra datum and only take care of the diagonal. And what you then get is here a representation of dimension vector D and here a representation of dimension vector E. Okay, that's basically the Hecke correspondence which we will use to define the convolution product, but we have to decorate everything with group actions. So here we have a natural... Uh, do we need a name for this? Yes, we need a name for this, sorry. Let's call this ZDE. So here we have a natural action of GD cross GE. Here we have the natural base change action of GD plus E. And now we also need, uh, need a group which somehow um, mediates between these two groups. And what we take is the natural parabolic group PDE. This is also a group of 
upper triangular base change matrices. That's the maximal parabol or product of maximal parabolics. Yeah? And from this parabolic group, you can project to the groups on the diagonal. This is the, the Levy, sub, uh, Levy quotient. And it also embeds into this group here. And it acts, acts here because upper triangular block matrices act on upper triangular block matrices. So that's a simple idea. And this actually gives you a very nice operation in equivariant cohomology. So let's start with... Equivariant cohomology um, with respect to the group GD of RD, tensor equivariant cohomology with respect to the group GE of RE. And we want to end up in equivariant cohomology with respect to GD plus E of RD plus E. Yeah? And that's the geometry we can use for this. Okay? So let's first take the Kunis morphism in equivariant cohomology to get to the GD cross GE equivariant cohomology of RD cross GE. Okay? This map P is a trivial vector bundle, so we can easily change to the GD cross GE equivariant cohomology of the total space of this vector bundle instead. Okay? Then we can change the group because, uh, well, here we are just uh, taking the factor by a unipotent group and equivariant uh, cohomology is insensitive to unipotent groups. So we can identify this to the PDE equivariant cohomology of ZDE. Then there is a general induction isomorphism in equivariant cohomology. It allows you to replace this by GD plus E, equivariant cohomology of the associated fiber product, GD plus E over PDE of ZDE. And from there, you have a canonical multiplication morphism to the whole thing, induced by this embedding. And you take the composition of all these quite natural maps in equivariant cohomology, and that's it. Okay. Yeah, so every single step is a, is a very natural operation in equivariant cohomology. No mysteries there. And, um, okay, then you have to verify associativity of this product. That's lots of fun, and uh, you have to write down uh, huge diagrams. But um, nothing really... Um, spectacular happens in there. Yeah? So associativity uh, mainly has the reason that you can view the space of three by three block matrices in two different ways. You can either view it as a Two by two block extended by a one by one block, or a one by one block extended by a two by two block. That's associativity, basically. Okay. So <clears throat> wonderful. Uh, so fact. This map here, which I will now call multiplication star. star defines a unital associative, but in general non-commutative, um, NQ0 graded algebra structure on the cohomological Hall algebra of Q. All right. 
Well, even without the reference to uh, categorification of, of uh, motivic generating invariants, uh, this looks like a fun object to study. Yeah? It's, it's one of these convolution type algebras uh, which you see regularly in geometric representation theory. It's definitely something which deserves study. Um, but of course, uh, we don't want to study it uh, only because it looks natural, but because it really should categorify A of Q. So I have to convince you that uh, its Poincaré series is, well, at least closely related to AQ. That's the next thing. All right. So, now let me do this here. So, what is this? What is the cohomological Hall algebra as graded? or in fact, we'll see in a minute, bi-graded vector space. Okay, so for this we have to uh, study this equivariant cohomology. And uh, now that's a huge surprise, or better, disappointment. This group acts on this vector space linearly. Yeah? That's the, this linear conjugation act, which we have seen many times. As a topological space, this vector space is contractible. You can easily contract it to a point, namely to zero. Since the action of GD is linear, you can compatibly contract uh, RD as a GD variety to zero with a trivial GD action. So, just by being contractible, you see that this is canonically isomorphic to the GD equivariant cohomology of a point. And this is really a big disappointment since the, the structure of the quiver is not reflected at all in this. Yeah? All the arrows of the quiver are gone. The only thing we remember is well, how large the group is, how many vertices the quiver has. Okay, but yeah, let's do it anyway. Um, the equivariant cohomology of the point is, by definition of equivariant cohomology, the same as the uh, usual cohomology of the classifying space. GD is a product of general linear groups, and you know how the classifying spaces look like. They are infinite Grassmannians, so you can really compute this cohomology. And it is nothing else than tensor product over the vertices of the quiver. And for every single vertex, you get equivalent cohomology with respect to GLDI of a point. And that is uh, rational function, uh, symmetric polynomials in generators Xi1 to Xi di. So you have two sets of generators, you have uh, generators are indexed by two indices, one index for the vertex of the quiver and one index running from 1 to di. And then you take symmetric polynomials in these. Yeah? And uh, concerning cohomological degree, the degree of this xi uh, k is 2k. It's k. Sorry. I'm not taking the elementary symmetric functions, it's just k. Sorry. It's the, okay. This you can further identify, sorry for that, with, now you take the elementary symmetric functions in these, and uh, this is now in degree 2 di, these elementary symmetric functions. And then you write down the um, Poincaré series, of HQ in this realization is a priori uh, sum over all dimension vectors, product over all vertices. Yeah, and then we have a polynomial ring and the generators are in degree two to uh, di. And uh, so it's one minus one minus Q squared, one minus Q to the two di. Mm -hmm. Recall, 
how we wrote the motivic generating function. This we wrote as sum over all d minus L to the one half minus Euler form of dd divided by a modified Pochhammer symbol Okay. Aha. Sorry, Markus, just one quick question from a participant. Yes, please. Can you briefly recall what the Poincare series of the graded algebra is? Ah, okay. Yes, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay, and there's a missing t to the d. Okay, so, so this I define as the sum over all d, sum over all k, dimension of the kth equivariant cohomology uh, d. And then Q to the K, T to the D. Yeah, so the generating function for the dimension of the, of the homogeneous parts. And here, a priori, we have two gradings. We have the grading by the dimension vector, and we have the cohomological grading, which we have to modify in a minute. But at the moment, let's just take it like, like this. Okay? Does the Jackson integral or Melin Barnes presentation of AQ show up naturally in this context? If only I knew what this is. <laughs> so, <laughs> could the person making asking this question please send an email to me with some details? I would be happy to have a look at this. No idea. <laughs> okay, so so that's the the Poincaré series of of that algebra. A priori, we have the the dimension vector grading and the cohomological grading, and uh, and that is what we get from this elementary calculation. And while we see a little bit of the features of the motivic generating function, at least the denominator, uh, denominators look similar. Um, here, if you replace Q by L inverse, then that's fine. But uh, the numerator, the Euler form, is not yet incorporated. Of course it isn't, because this guy as a vector space doesn't depend on the quiver, on the arrow structure at all. So what's going wrong? Well. The arrow structure is encoded in the multiplication. Namely, what I haven't told you in writing down the multiplication is, while well, you see these dots here, so this was really hiding a problem, namely, um, this multiplication does not, um, is not compatible with cohomological degree. If you start in cohomological degrees k and l there, you don't end up in, end up in degree k plus l, but... So let me add something to this diagram. If you start in degree k here and degree l here, then you end up in cohomological degree k plus l minus the Euler form of the dimension vectors d and e. Ah, okay, so... There's a hint that really the multiplication of the quiver plays a role. Yeah? So, but this means in particular that the cohomological Hall algebra, a priori, is only a graded algebra in the grading by a dimension vector and not by cohomological degree. Because cohomological degree is messed up. There's one case where you can fix this. If the Euler form is symmetric, globally symmetric. Then this shift here, this minus DE, you can rewrite as minus ED, and then you can regrade the algebra. We can uh, renormalize the cohomological grading. by a term minus one half Euler form dd. And then this suddenly, this multiplication becomes compatible with the cohomological grading. Yeah? You add a minus one half dd here. You add a minus one half dd to the cohomological grading here a minus one half ee to the cohomological grading here, and then here you arrive at minus one half dd, minus one half ee, 
And this you can rewrite as minus one half dE plus minus one half uh, ED. So this whole thing is then nothing else than minus one half d plus e, d plus e. Okay, that was the calculation which I told you at the beginning I will not show you, so uh, I showed it anyway. Okay, well. Can I ask about the, sh the shifting degree? Which, which one of the maps you compose introduces the shift? Is it the middle? Ah, uh, okay. Um, it, the, the problem is here. So um, here you are taking the embedding of ZDE in, in RDE. And if you push forward, then you get a degree shift and you also get another degree shift from, from the change of the group here. Okay, but this is a calculation I really don't want to show now. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. So if the Euler form is symmetric, you can renormalize the cohomological grading by this and then you get that the Hall algebra, cohomological Hall algebra, is actually NQ0 cross Z graded. You get another hidden grading. And then I guess you believe me that the relation to the motivic generating function becomes much stronger because, well, it's precisely here, this term minus one half dd. Sorry, is it Z or Z over two? Because uh, if you put one half of dd, it might be... Uh uh, yes, one half that. Uh, yeah, 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 you're right. I should better. Um, yeah, 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 you're right. If I have an odd number of loops at a vertex, then I, then I have to allow half integers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one half that. Okay. Okay. And if you do this little renormalization by the cohomological, uh, in the cohomological grading, then you certainly believe that in the numerator, this additional term pops up, minus one half of Euler form dd. And so that is roughly the reason why the cohomological Hall algebra categorifies A of Q. Okay, so we categorified A of Q. The Euler form is almost never Actually, yes, um, it is. Yes, this is only for special quivers, but this is interesting enough. Is this some sort of a collateral condition? Mm, no. <laughs> Bit simple minded answer, but no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Well, globally, for this Euler form to be symmetric, you need that the quiver is symmetric. The number of arrows from I to J is the same as from J to I. Globally, this might be very special, but we already have seen this condition locally, yeah? that the restriction to a certain slope has this property. This will, of course, resurface now. Um, ah, okay. I should briefly mention something but for this, I will not write down the formula because we will not use it. Um, the fun uh, with the cohomological Hall algebra is that in working with it, you can argue geometrically, yeah, really compute cohomology of, say, certain strata in these RD. But you can also work algebraically because there's an algebraic description of it. So using equivariant localization, you get an explicit algebraic description as a shuffle algebra with, with kernel. Explicit description of the multiplication as shuffle product with kernel. I don't want to write down the formula now. Uh, because it is really long and I have to explain all the terms, but the idea is somehow quite natural. So as a vector space, we have identified the coha with, well, tuples of symmetric polynomials. 
Now, what is the multiplication in terms of these symmetric polynomials? And one can really make this explicit using standard techniques, equivariant localization. You really take these tuples of symmetric polynomials, you perform something called a shuffle product, but in the shuffle product there's an additional term, the so-called kernel, which reflects again the arrow structure of the quiver. Yeah, the formula is, is long and we don't really need it in the following because we will stick to our geometric intuition. But um, the fun in Koha is combining the geometric approach and this purely algebraic approach. Yeah? So sometimes you just do a few pages of algebraic calculations with shuffle products. All right, so we accomplished the first thing for today. Namely, we categorified AQ. We realized that as a Poincaré series of an algebra, which is naturally associated to the quiver, it reflects the, um, the geometry of the quiver, the geometry of this variety of representations, and it reflects the, the category behind the quivers. It reflects the category because, well, what we are doing is we are somehow involving all short exact sequences in the multiplication. So the whole category structure is somewhere reflected. So, categorify AQ. And now the question is, what are then the categorification of these various factorization identities, which we found in the last three days? And this is what I will now show. Okay, so we got three factorizations. And each of these factorizations has, uh, admits an algebraic analog for the cohomological Hall algebra. And uh, I want to formulate this and get to the point where you see that, um, that these algebraic facts, which I will write down, are really categorifications of these uh, factorization identities. Okay, to do this, we need one more ingredient. Um, so if mu is again, final ingredient, So if you not only have the, the quiver, but also a stability on the quiver in the form of such a slope function as before, then you can define a local version of the Koha HQ X semi-stable. Um, so for any real slope X. And the slope local version is well, we had a slope local version of the motivic generating function, so you can almost guess the definition. This is defined as direct sum of equivariant cohomology. But now the direct sum is only over those dimension vectors which are of slope x. And this time I'm ignoring the problem with d equals zero. You can guess what it is. And uh, then we don't take the cohomology of the whole variety, but just of the open part uh, of semi-stable points. Okay. So it's defined. Okay. So in complete analogy with this slope-local motivic generating function, you have the slope-local cohomological Hall algebra. A uh, set of semi-stable points is GD equivariant. That's why this is well-defined. And um, concerning the convolution along short exact sequences, if you have semi-stable rep well, semi representations of a fixed slope form an abelian subcategory. That's a completely general statement. Yeah? In particular, if you have two semi-stables of the same slope, take an arbitrary extension, it's again a semi-stable of the same slope. So that means our convolution product along short exact sequences preserves semi-stability and we really get this local algebra. This guy is much more serious than the, the global Koha. The global Koha admits a very simple algebraic description because the space whose equivariant cohomology we take is just a vector space. And here it is just some strange Zariski open subset. Yeah? So this guy you can not treat algebraically, you can only treat it um, 
geometrically. All right, so um, let me write down categorified factorization one. So we have to remind ourselves what was this factorization one. I took this motivic generating function aq with a slightly shifted variable t and divided it by another shift of the variable t. And then what we got was the motivic generating series of Hilbert schemes. The algebraic analog of this is if you take the direct sum over all d of all the non-equivariant usual cohomology of these Hilbert schemes, Then the cohomological Hall algebra acts on this. Is a module for the cohomological Hall algebra for any n. And in fact, one which is even cyclic. And if you take the limit for large n, then uh, you get the whole COA, in a sense. Okay, let, let me try to make this, this precise. So um, let's, let's take this, this thing here. And now let's change n, make it bigger and bigger. Well, this is a module which is cyclic, so you always have a projection from HQ to this. Originally, you have an action of HQ, but since it is a cyclic module, you have a projection. Okay? Uh, in fact, there are even natural connecting maps between, between these. So, we can take the, the limit over all n. Now, I have to be careful. It's the inverse limit. And in the inverse limit, we have an isomorphism. So that means the kernels of these projections get smaller and smaller at the end. Yeah, so we can approximate the cohomological Hall algebra by all its modules, and these modules are given by cohomology of Hilbert schemes. And that is the categorification of the first factorization formula. That's quite satisfying, right? We have an algebra and uh, the uh, Hilbert schemes give us natural modules. Okay. Factorization two is something you can um, almost guess from the definitions. Factorization two was the wall crossing formula that the motivic generating function aq is an ordered product over all the local aqx. And uh, so categorified factorization two is the Koha analog of the wall crossing formula. And it just tells us that h of q is isomorphic to an ordered tensor product over the reals of these local guys, these local coas. Unfortunately, this is not an isomorphism of algebras, but only of, uh, by a graded vector, uh, of graded vector spaces. Q vector spaces. Okay, but the map is somehow quite natural. So that's the way you categorify wall crossing. Yeah? And now, well, you can imagine if you take Poincaré series of both sides in the right ring, then you get precisely Poincaré series of the left is ordered product of the Poincaré series of these guys. And since these Poincaré series are the motivic generating functions, this reproves the wall crossing formula. Or this is the categorification. Okay. Maybe we will have time for a concrete example where we will actually see this. Um, Can you explain what the map is? 
<laughs> yes. <clears throat> uh, um, well, the map again comes from the fact that Rd is uh, stratified into Hardenauer Simon strata. Uh, how did I call this? D dot Hn. Yeah? So you have these, this decomposition into these locally closed Hardenauer Simon strata. And now you have to uh, look very closely what this induces in equivariant cohomology. Actually, what we do is we first um, pass to equivariant Chow groups and show that the, that the equivariant cycle map is an isomorphism. Then we work with Chow groups because, well, some things are just nicer in there. Yeah, you don't have the long exact sequences of cohomology. And there you can see easily that this decomposes the equivariant Chow group into equivariant Chow groups of, of these local guys. But it's, it's essentially the same trick, just the hardener Simon certification. Good question. Does it also preserve the degree in the shifted grading of the cohomology? Ha -ha. Uh, yes, yes. If, if you start with a symmetric quiver and do the corresponding shift here and here, then the, uh, this uh, modified cohomological grading is preserved. Yeah. Categorified factorization three. Now, that was the Donaldson Thomas invariance, yeah? What we did was we took the motivic generating function, the local version, and wrote it as a plethistic exponential. And the coefficients popping up there, we called the Donaldson Thomas invariance. And then we saw, indeed, they have geometric meaning. This also works here. So, and you can already guess what the assumption is. Assume, again, that the Euler form restricted to one slope is symmetric. And then, as I explained globally, yeah, I ex only explained this for the global coha, but you can do this, this shift in cohomological degree then also locally. Let's see. If this thing is globally symmetric, we can renormalize the cohomological grading on the whole coha, and under this local condition, we can renormalize the grading locally for the local Hall algebra. Uh, so let's do this. Renormalize the cohomological grading on the local Hall algebra. Then, so we want to categorify this notion of factoring it into an exp to a plethistic exponential. And, um, well, this is really a, a, a key calculation, which one should do at some point. If you do exp on the level of Poincaré series, then what you are doing on the level of algebras is you're taking the symmetric algebra. Yeah? The exp is just taking the symmetric algebra. Well, if you have ever calculated Poincaré series of symmetric algebras, well, you get a nice product factorization. And these product factorizations are encoded in the X. So, in this case, we somehow expect, as categorification, the statement that this is related to some symmetric algebra. Well, this is not literally true, but uh, you can filter this algebra, and the associated graded is then a symmetric algebra. Then, there exists a filtration. F on the slope local cohomological Hall algebra such that the associated graded is isomorphic to a symmetric algebra of some bigraded space dt dot dot and a free variable z in degree 0, 2. Okay, let's try to digest this. Let's compare it with, uh, with the AQ side.
So that was uh, that was the factorization for the AQ. Okay, <clears throat> so taking the associated graded with respect to a nice filtration does not change the um, the Poincaré series at all. Yeah. So the Poincaré series doesn't know whether you took the associated graded or not, but it has to be there. And uh, then you get a symmetric algebra because on the level of Poincaré series, taking the symmetric algebra is the same as taking this plethistic exponential. But you have to be careful. We are working with even and odd degrees. So you have to understand this as the graded symmetric algebra. So you have to understand it in the super sense. The symmetric algebra over even variables is a polynomial ring. The symmetric algebra over odd variables is an exterior algebra. We'll see this in the example. Exterior algebras really appear. This free variable z, that corresponds to this uh, obligatory term here, which we have seen geometrically coming from the virtual motive of a trivially acting multiplicative group of the complex numbers. Yeah? So this appears here as a free variable. And this double graded dt space, well, that's a space whose Poincaré series is this. Yeah? So uh, going through this term by term, you really see that this fits perfectly with what we wrote down yesterday. There is a question. Yes, please. Uh, is this semi-stable koha a sort of root subalgebra? A root subalgebra? Yes. Okay, so I will give you in a minute the example of the Konecker quiver. Then you can really see what happens. Yeah? So in, in general, the problem is, well, you have to find a stability which is well adapted to the roots of the corresponding root system. This not always works out well. We already discussed this two days ago. But in the case, for example, of the Kronecker quiver, it really fits nicely and we'll see this. Okay. Um, problem is, this um, nobody knows what this uh, filtration is. This is the... Ben Davison call it the, calls it the perverse filtration. So it's really uh, deeply buried in, in algebraic geometry, in the, weight, in the weight structure of cohomology. And uh, well, at least I can't compute it in any single case where it is non-trivial. Yeah? So the only case where this grading, oh, we'll see this in an example. There's one case where this grading really actually appears and plays an important role. And uh, in this case, I can compute the associated, the, this algebra algebraically with this approach by equivariant localization and shuffle products, but I can't really work with the perverse filtration. And so this is, uh, so this theorem is really nice and really general, but uh, with this theorem, it's difficult to work out examples. And uh, this brings us to, finally, to examples. Well, our standard, now we will also categorify our standard examples, of course, yeah? Our standard examples always were the trivial quiver, the one loop quiver, and then with respect to the DT invariance, we saw yesterday two vertex quivers. And so what we will do is trivial quiver, one loop quiver, and the Kronecker quiver. In the Kronecker quiver case, we will see the full power of these factorization two and three. So, exercises, uh, examples. Q the trivial quiver. Of course, it would be great to do this in all details, but um, no, I'm not suggesting that we do this in the question and answers because uh, um, all these shuffle product calculations, I don't know if I can do them out of my head. Well, okay, we'll see. Um, in this case, the COA is the symmetric algebra, yeah, without any without any associate graded, it just is the symmetric algebra over a one-dimensional dt space. Ah, that's something we already know, right? We know that for the qu uh, trivial quiver, we have a dt invariant in degree one only, which is one. Ah, so this dt dot dot should be one-dimensional space. Okay, so it's just a one-dimensional space. That's the dt. And we have this free variable z. So we have a polynomial ring. Forget the ring structure. Just polynomials with its usual countable basis. And then you take the associate, you take the symmetric algebra over it. But the symmetric algebra you have to be careful about. It's in the graded sense. 
And in fact, this is now placed in odd degree. Yeah? So this Q is actually placed in degree 1, 1, one for the dimension vector and one for the cohomological, shifted cohomological degree. So the symmetric algebra is an exterior algebra. So the Koha is an exterior algebra in countably many generators. Okay. For the one loop quiver, well, we have also seen that the dt invariant uh, lives only in one degree and it was minus L to the one half. So also only one dimensional. Aha. So we have again just this, but now in degree one zero in the shifted degree in even degree. So what you get is really a symmetric algebra. Symmetric algebra in countably many variables. Okay, and seeing this, uh, the countably generated exterior and countably generated symmetric algebra appearing, this of course cries for both on fermion correspondence as we have uh, already discussed on, on Monday. Well, unfortunately, that is the only example of such a duality. Yeah? So the duality is when you uh, turn the number of arrows in the quiver to the negative and shift on the diagonal. And the only case where this is really related to quivers is this duality between the trivial and the one loop quiver. And that's it. Yeah? So unfortunately, this duality doesn't, uh, doesn't generalize to other classes of quivers. Okay, so, and um, final example is the Kronecker quiver. And again, we have to choose a stability. It's more or less arbitrary. Let me take d1 minus d2 divided by d1 plus d2. And uh, we have seen the root system yesterday. Yeah, we have the, uh, take the a1 tilde root system. or its positive part. These are the real roots. They are of the form 1, 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, and so on. And then you see the slopes are 1 divided by an odd number. 1 or minus 1 divided by an odd number. So what you get is you get slope local Hall algebras only in degree, only in for slope x. And for all the um, one divided, plus or minus one divided by an odd number, minus one third, minus one fifth, minus one seventh, and so on. So these are the only slopes which appear. So, so this is a set of slopes to make it precise. If x is a real number which is not in this set of slopes, then the local Koha is the trivial algebra. Okay? The local Hall algebras for plus or minus 1 divided by something odd. corresponding to the real roots, they look like the Kohas for the trivial quiver. That's what always happens for real roots. Yeah? They look like the trivial quiver. So exterior algebra in countably many generators. And uh, finally, we have this uh, zero part for the imaginary root, and that algebra is really complicated. It somehow um, feels Yangian. So um, it is actually generated by two series of infinitely many generators and then terribly many quadratic relations, which are not really illuminating if I write them down, but it really looks like a very degenerate form of a Yangian algebra. So that's where really interesting cohomological Hall algebras appear. Um, but in general, these local Hall algebras are, if they're interesting, they're almost impossible to calculate, unfortunately. Okay, 
So that's all I can say about these uh, Kohas, and that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, so I'm thinking also of this uh, whole algebra with uh, finite fields coefficient. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, somehow specialized to them in some way? No. <clears throat> the the Hall algebras they usually define these Ringel Hall algebras. You define in a completely different theory. So Ringel Hall algebras are defined by a similar or let me just say by the same convolution product but in very different theories. So if we stick to, to the complex numbers then what you would take is the um, you would take the, the space of constructible GD invariant functions on RD. Yeah. Constructible GD invariant functions on RD. This is what you would do over the complex numbers. Or in the finite field case, you would just work with uh, arbitrary um, GD invariant functions. So this is really functions. This is not polynomial functions. Yeah. I'm not talking about invariant polynomial functions, just invariant constructible functions. So this is what you do and over FQ. You would just take ah, C valued, Q, sorry, Q valued, Q valued is enough, Q valued, and also here Q valued, just arbitrary GD FQ invariant functions on rd fq and i don't know of any uh, reasonable uh, of, uh, of any well behaved map from say equivariant cohomology to equivariant uh, to invariant constructible functions which induces a, a map in uh, on the whole algebra on a deeper level on a very deep level, a posteriori, after many, many computations, then you suddenly see that certain algebras can be realized both as whole algebras of functions and they also pop up as cohomological whole algebras. But the experts for, for this are uh, uh, here in the room, <laughs> but it's not me. Yeah, but at a very deep level, yes, but there's nothing obvious, uh, uh, somehow, a priori. Yeah, because there are two dimensional cohorts. The two dimensional cohorts. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, the two dimensional. If you start with, say, preprojective algebras, yeah. Are computation over finite fields related to computations in the materic uh, connection? Yes, yes. <clears throat> yes. So, um, I, when I, when I, uh, showed you the ideas behind the proofs of these of these factorization formulas I always tried this uh, try to do this as geometrically as possible <clears throat> but in fact it is also possible to prove these factorization identities algebraically in this cohomological in, in, in this um, this usual ringel hall algebra so to briefly indicate what you do yeah let me work with finite fields So I take the direct sum over, over all d, and now here I'm taking the gd invariant functions on, on this over finite fields, and then there is a map which uh, map the whole algebra integral to our motivic ring. Uh, this is not really true. We have to. Uh, we have to uh, complete here. Let me take not the direct sum, but the direct product. There's a, there's a natural map from there to there. Namely, 
Um, essentially, you map a function on Rd to, ah oh no, let me not formulate it, sorry. <laughs> let me just say this exists a Q algebra homomorphism. And that means you can also formulate identities in the Ringel Hall algebra. And you uh, find these identities somehow out of the representation theory of the curves and integrate them to get identities here. Yeah? So uh, representation theoretic identities in the left hand side, which is the Ringel Hall algebra. integrate to certain factorization identities in the motivic quantum space. And uh, well here don't see the, the motives. Uh, one feature of the specialization is that Q is mapped to the left shed's motive, which is quite natural because well the number of, of of FQ rational points in the affine line is Q, and this should map to the left shed's motive. Okay, just as a as a vague uh, <clears throat> identification of uh, how one can prove these factorization identities representation theoretically, which is an aspect I didn't want to elaborate on because I wanted to emphasize the the geometry and at the end the the Koha categorification. Are there many questions? Yes, many there's one, yeah. How counting can we find a field is related to counting? Um, well, so 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 that's the pragmatic solution. What one should really take here is uh, the motivic Hall algebra. There also exists a motivic Hall algebra, and this would be the correct thing to write down there. Um, namely, the motivic Hall algebra would be, let me work in this completed setup again, you take the, uh, not the Gurtney group of varieties over C, but a relative version, Gurtney group of varieties over the variety, ah, okay, over the quotient stack. Now, okay, I should do stacks, okay. So all this is in a nicely explained, explained in Tom Richland's papers. Yeah, you take the, the Grotendieck group, the relative version of the Grotendieck group of stacks over the quotient stack Rd by Gd. And on this level, you also have such a convolution product. And from this, you have an algebra homomorphism to this because counting points over finite fields is a motivic measure. Yeah, so the map here is just to the motive x, you associate, well, the number of, of rational points over fq of x, basically, because this has this motivic behavior. So that's yet another ingredient which, which is behind all this. Yeah. So questions on Zoom. Okay. Uh, is there a double action of the Koha on the cohomology of Hilbert scheme? A double, ah, okay. Um, <laughs> no, so there are many attempts to, um, to double this action, yeah? So, <clears throat> I know the direction of this question, yeah. So the HQ acts on, on direct sum of cohomology of, of Hilbert schemes. Uh, but the fact that this is a cyclic module is a bit disappointing. What you really want to have is, you want to have something like a, like a Drinfeld double of this, for which this is, well, maybe even an irreducible representation. So the action of AQ, HQ is raising the degree, raising operators. But you also want lowering operators. You want to have this, this should be kind of a Fox space, yeah? Uh, this was defined somehow in an ad hoc way, in, in several ways, but there's no easy geometric way to do it. 
Yeah. So it's not clear how to do it in general. Another question. Some people have answered it, but still maybe you want okay. to answer it. Uh, are the shuffle algebras which were mentioned related to those which appear in the description of quantum toroidal algebra? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I'm glad when other people answered. Great. <laughs> it's again this two-dimensional. It's again this two-dimensional thing. Okay. There was a question by Fabian. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, for this integration. You you don't need the assumption that the curve is symmetric or anything like this, right? Oh uh, no, no. That's that's uh, at this point it's completely general. No. Yes, please. Um, so in this theorem about uh, associated graded being symmetric. Yeah. Invariance. So can this um, like dt uh, bracket z? Can this be equipped with some Lie brackets so that uh -huh. algebras? Look, looks tempting, right? I mean, the, the, the best known example of an algebra which looks like a symmetric algebra up to taking the associated graded with respect to a um, filtration is the enveloping algebra of a Lie algebra because then you take the PBW filtration and the associated graded is a symmetric algebra. That's the PBW theorem. Um, and it's, of course, tempting to look for a Lie algebra structure. I think, again, the answer is uh, in the 2D setup. So for pre-projective algebras, there you can expect, expect this. Related to um, well, the analog of dt invariance is then the Katz polynomials, and you can expect then an interesting Lie algebra. I doubt that there is such an interesting Lie algebra here in the, in the Kruver setting. Yeah, the Kruver setting is somehow too degenerate. But if you like do previous with potentials, then huh. I guess you expect or I guess um, in some appropriate modification this still holds and was proven in full generality by Sven Meinhardt and Ben Davison. But um, it's even less explicit. And I don't know of, of any examples which you can calculate in the 3CY setup. Yeah. Any further questions? Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering how does HQ acts on the direct sum of inverts? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Convolution. It's again by a convolution, namely you, you, you look at this basic convolution diagram uh, which we had, uh, Rd plus E, and uh, well this, this help dn, this we realized as um, a quotient. Well we only did this in the exercise session, yeah, but we did. Um, you take a certain set of stable points in an extended representation variety, and that does the trick. So all you have to do is um, extend this convolution product to these extended representation varieties, but you shouldn't extend everywhere. Yeah? So here you take the usual, unextended, here you take the extended, here you take the extended, and some corresponding Hecke correspondence. And then you have to think about uh, that this everything is compatible with stability, and then this convolution operation gives you this action. Yeah? And then to check that this is really a cyclic module, you have to know about the fine structure of this cohomology. Okay, if this time there are no extra questions, I want to thank Marcus again. Thank you.